So most of you know me from doing the announcements and the tidbit, um, but for those who don't know me, as Dave said, my name is Margie Amon. I've been a member of Crosspoint since it began, and prior to that, a member of Mosaic for 10 or 11 or 12 years. Um, I've been married to Tim Amon for 31 years. He's here somewhere. Um, oh, there he is. <laughs> um, and uh, we have two adult children. Uh, Justice is one. You're probably familiar with him. You've seen him around here, and he's married to Dionysia. And then Morgan is uh, my other um, uh, daughter, or my other child, and uh, she lives in Indiana um, and is married to a young man named Wally. Um, I've been a pharmacist for 31 years, and I work with Swedes or UW Health, um, and I'm really honored, and if I'm going to be honest, just a little bit nervous about bringing the word to you this morning. Uh, but I want to start off by saying something specifically to the camera folks. So unlike Dave, I am probably not going to move from this spot. So, <laughs> so you can take a break and relax because today is going to be really easy for you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Um, so we started a new summer series looking at the book of Philippians to help us grow in our understanding and application of what it means to live as citizens of heaven. The book is about Christ in our life, Christ in our mind, Christ as our goal, Christ as our strength, joy through suffering, perseverance, and faith even in the face of adversity, and the hope of resurrection life. Paul, writing from prison, has used the life of Jesus Christ as our primary example to follow, teaching us that we are to have the same mindset as Jesus. He has given us practical ways to live this out, such as doing everything without complaining or arguing, which is a really hard one for me. <laughs> um, Michael taught us last week that nothing compares to knowing Christ and that our righteousness is based on faith in Christ and not on ourselves. We learned that our value and identity are not based on what we do, look like, sound like, or anything other than the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross. And so we are to press on in this race that God has called us to be on so that we may receive our heavenly reward. Today, as we continue in this book, we're going to look at what Paul has to say about maturity and role models. He's given us multiple examples of role models to follow in this book so far, including himself. And as I thought about maturity, the term adulting came to mind. Well, adulting is a slang term for acting like a mature adult, doing everyday, ordinary tasks that are not fun or rewarding, but are required of a responsible adult. So I found these humorous thoughts on adulthood or adulting that I thought I'd share with you. I used to sneak out of my house to go to parties, and now I sneak out of parties to go to my house. <laughs> I wish I was still a kid so I could just take a long nap and everyone would be proud of me. <laughs> Adulting is that horrifying moment when you're looking for an adult, but then you realize that you are an adult. So you look for an older adult, someone successfully adulting, an adultier adult. So from that last humorous comment, we find some truth, and that is that we look for people to follow. But who should we follow? And all you have to do is scroll on Facebook for a while, and you'll find all kinds of people telling you why you should follow them. Whether it's a revolutionary diet, a new exercise program, a new way to think, um, or a person who just posts about their perfect life, they all promise to lead you to the perfect life that you've been dreaming of. Well, the truth is the road to maturity isn't always easy or fun, but it is rewarding if we allow the Lord to lead us. So how do we know this? Because scripture tells us this. So remember several weeks ago we read Philippians 1.6, which says being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So we know that God will finish what he has started in us. Spiritual maturity is achieved through becoming more like Jesus Christ. After salvation, every Christian begins the process of spiritual growth with the intent to become spiritually mature. 
According to the Apostle Paul, we, as we learned last week, it's an ongoing process that will never end in this life. Sometimes we foolishly think that we already are mature and wise, but if we remember all that we've learned so far, we'll acknowledge that we fall short and we must keep our eyes on Jesus, for he is our righteousness. He has to be our source of wisdom. And what I want you to learn today is that a mature Christian is led and transformed by Jesus. So let's start by reading the six verses that we'll be studying today, and then we'll break it down. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open it up to Philippians chapter 3. And if you can find the New Testament, which is sort of in the middle, um, then just keep going to the right, and you will find Philippians after the book of Ephesians. And if you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the pew in front of you. So starting in verse 15 of chapter 3, All of us then, who are mature, should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained." Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Well, as we've walked through this letter, you may have recognized many verses that are beloved and often quoted. You might even remember Dave telling us that, that many of these verses would, um, that we come across in this study would be ones that you would memorize or put up on your refrigerator. Um, verses like chapter 3, verse 7, which we read last week and says, uh, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Well, today aren't those verses. Um, You probably are not as familiar with these verses, but they're still incredibly important and they're worth memorizing just like the ones that are more familiar. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in. Uh, We're going to read verses 15 and 16 again. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Paul is talking about having a mature mindset here. According to the dictionary, if you were to describe someone as mature, you would think that they are fully developed and balanced in their personality and their emotional behavior. So Paul is referring to um, to a Christian moving in the direction of being fully developed and balanced through a transforming relationship with Jesus. He tells us that we're, we're to take such a view of things. So what view is he talking about? Well, if you remember last week, Michael helped us to see that our righteousness is based on Christ alone and not anything good that we have done. We may be able to recount all of our accomplishments and all of our acts of service and obedience to the Lord, but all of it is garbage compared to knowing Christ. In addition from the verses last week, Michael taught us about three important Christian doctrines, justification, which is the gracious act of God in forgiving and declaring righteous any sinner who believes in Jesus. The second doctrine that we learned, uh, which is part of this view that Paul is calling us to agree with, is sanctification. Sanctification refers to the believer's progressive growth in holiness or conformity to the image of Christ. It means being set apart for God and his work and becoming more fully obedient to God in daily life. The last doctrine that we learned um, last week was glorification. And the glorification of the Christian, Christian is that we will share in God's glory when we are in our resurrected bodies in the new heavens and new earth, experiencing deeper fellowship with God and not being at risk of falling away into sin, God's glory finally being all in all. So additionally, Paul is calling us to keep running this race that Jesus has called us to run. 
So Paul's not saying that we should be perfect because a mature Christian knows they aren't perfect. But a mature Christian does recognize the worth of our glorious Savior and will agree with Paul on everything he's said so far and won't turn away from the goal of coming to know Christ more deeply. Note that Paul says us in these verses, so he's including himself. He's not acting in a superior way. He's talking with his brothers and sisters in Christ, so he's having a family conversation with people that he loves. So how do you talk to people about Jesus and all that you're learning? Is it a loving conversation with the family, or do you have an attitude of superiority? Paul notes that we might think differently on some topics. Most theologians believe that Paul isn't talking about major differences, but minor differences in thought. Why? Because if the differences were significant, Paul would have specified what those issues were. He would have mentioned them by name. Whatever these issues were, though, they were apparently keeping the Philippians from a mature understanding. Honestly, though, differences in thought is a common occurrence amongst Christians and people in general. We frequently discuss and debate what Scripture means, but I love Paul's encouragement to us to have a heart open to the Holy Spirit's guidance. Because God will make his truth clear if we truly seek him. So how open is your heart to the Holy Spirit's leading? How willing are you to be corrected in your thinking? Many years ago, I was a foreign exchange student to France. This was the summer before my senior year in high school. This should have been an amazing and fantastic trip. And sadly, it was probably one of the worst experiences in my life. Um, and the reason for that was because the kids on the trip were awful. Um, I was the only um, person from my high school that went, so I didn't really know, know any of them. And, um, you know, you would see, when, when I was that age, you would watch those movies, those teen movies, and you would see all the mean girls. And honestly, I never believed that people were really that mean. And from that trip, I learned that not only are they that mean, but they are often worse. So from then on, <clears throat> because, of, um, because many of the, the people that were mean to me on that trip were extremely attractive um, females, I had this ridiculous belief that attractive, stylish women were never Christian. So I know you can laugh because it's, a, it's stupid, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Um, so then one day I'm dropping my kids off at, Christ at uh, Christian Life, um, a Christian school, and I saw um, a woman who is now a very dear friend of mine also dropping her kids off at school. She always has her makeup done and her hair is perfect and dressed perfectly, and I totally judged her. I thought to myself, there is no way that she could be a Christian. She's just there because she doesn't want her kids in public school. Well, God has a sense of humor because I started attending BSF, which is Bible Study Fellowship, and who walks into my small group that very first night but my dear friend. And so God showed me how ridiculous my thinking was so that I could grow and mature and be more like Jesus. So we all have thinking that may not line up with God's perfect wisdom because of our past experiences and hurts. But if we're willing to be corrected, God can work a beautiful masterpiece in our lives. And to this day, that woman is one of my dearest friends. It's important to remember the importance of unity in the body of Christ when we talk about differences in our beliefs. So the example that I gave was a little ridiculous, but with the election coming up, there will be all kinds of differences in opinions and beliefs. But ultimately, our allegiance is to Jesus. And when we turn to Scripture, we see that we are called to unity. Philippians 2.2, 2, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. 
Philippians 1.27, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And then John 17, verses 22 and 23, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. When we are unified and love each other despite our differences, we show the world the love of Jesus. Well, Paul is calling us to know Christ and submit to him completely. He's asking us to turn to the Lord for his perfect wisdom. He's asking us to have humble hearts that are willing to be corrected. And then in verse 16, we are asked to live up to what we have attained. In other words, we are to live what we say we believe. We are to put into practice the truth we possess and comprehend. If you are a follower of Christ, then that means living out what you've learned and understand so far about Christ and what you say you believe. I, if I know that I shouldn't touch a hot stove because it's hot and I don't want to get burned, then how foolish would I be if having this knowledge I chose to touch the stove and burn myself anyway? So therefore, what we understand about Christ and our call to follow him needs to show up in how we live our daily lives. How can we live that out practically? How can we live up to what we have attained? Well, we can love others just as we love ourselves. It means loving those that we don't like. It means taking care of your neighbor's cat when they're on vacation, even though you hate cats, just like our pastor Dave does. <laughs> But he took care of the cat anyway. <laughs> it means obeying God even when it's hard and you don't feel like it. It's not just outwardly saying we believe these things, um, but it's allowing our hearts to be changed by Jesus so that our behaviors naturally fall in line with his desires. One of my favorite Dave Spooner quotes is that if Jesus has your heart, then the behavior will fall in place naturally. The focus is on your heart. So does Jesus have your heart? Are you going to praise him when life is hard, just as much as you praise him when everything is going your way? Remember early in the, earlier in the year we were studying the Gospel of John and on Palm Sunday the people praised Jesus because there was nothing required of them and it was easy. But at the cru crucifixion, many were no longer praising him because it was hard, and now there was a cost to following him. A few weeks ago, I had to have a repeat mammogram, and I had read the report of the original exam, and they saw something that wasn't there last time. So all these thoughts are running through my mind, and I had to decide if I was going to live up to the truth that I know. Will I praise him no matter what the outcome of the test is? Do I really believe that to live is Christ and to die is gain? What about you? What challenge in your life is Jesus asking you to respond to according to the truth that you've been given and understand? Maybe some of you are thinking that your past disqualifies you from all that you see Jesus doing in the lives of others. Maybe you're thinking that he saved you, but that's as far as it goes because you've messed up too much. Well, I have good news for you. There is no minimum moral requirement to be a follower of Jesus. So no matter what you've done, good or bad, your past can't qualify you or disqualify you. And if you have a relationship with Jesus, then his desire is for you to continue to grow and mature in your relationship with him. I have held on to shame because of some poor choices that I made 20 years ago. And I didn't even realize that I was still allowing this shame to hold me back in, my matur in, in maturing in my relationship um, with Jesus until last year uh, when I was asked to pray about whether God was calling me to be the teaching leader for BSF, which is Bible Study Fellowship. It was a great honor to be asked, um, but I didn't want to tarnish the reputation of BSF because of the shame that I held on to from these past sins. So I almost said no. 
However, after much prayer, I felt the Lord was calling me to say yes to that position. And at the end of the year, one of the ladies asked me what the most significant thing God had done in my life, um, that, what was the most significant thing that God had done in my life that year. Well, after studying Peter's reinstatement by Jesus in John chapter 21, both here at Cross Point and also in BSF, the Lord began to show me that it was time to lay down my shame from 20 years ago once and for all. I knew that Jesus had forgiven me and cleansed me, and now it was time to let go of the shame and embrace the freedom in Christ that I, that I encouraged others to embrace. So what past sins is the Lord asking you to release to him, allowing his forgiveness to bring you freedom? What area of service is the Lord calling you to that you've rejected, thinking that you aren't mature enough? As we look again to the text, note that Paul isn't reprimanding the Philippian believers for their level of maturity. He's not showing displeasure with them. He's accepted them as they, as they were, called them to realistically evaluate themselves and be willing to move on from there and continue growing in Christ. They had been taught the gospel and now they needed to make it the standard by which they lived. We can get to a level of maturity and be, stat be satisfied and become stagnant in our growth in Christ. But Paul is encouraging them not to coast into heaven, but to have an active, ongoing, and aggressive demand for more of Christ in their lives. I don't know about you, but that challenges me. And I have to ask myself if I'm really seeking to know Christ more and more. Well, as we move on to the next section, we're going to read verse 17. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Before we go further, I want to point out that Paul refers to the Philippians as brothers and sisters. So again, this is family advice. Paul is calling them and us to follow in his footsteps as he imitates Christ. But notice in the latter part of verse 17, Paul moves from follow my example to now reminding them to keep their eyes on those who live as we do. So who is we? Well, so far in Philippians, Paul has taught us about four models of Christian behavior. First is Jesus, who exemplifies humility. Obviously, Jesus exemplifies much more than just humility, but in chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, this is what Paul emphasized. Um, secondly, Paul points out Timothy in chapter 2, verses 19 to 24, um, who exemplifies love and compassion. And then in the third example, in chapter 2, verses 25 to 30, Paul writes to them about Epaphroditus, who exemplifies perseverance in suffering. And then finally, Paul himself exemplifies steadfastness in the pursuit of Christ in verses um, 4 through 14 in chapter 3. So we're going to look at each of these people a little bit more closely. First, we have Christ as a role model to follow, which we saw in chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And that says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used um, for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now I'm going, not going to go into great detail in these verses because Lee Eklov did that um, a few weeks ago and did an amazing job. So if you missed that, that uh, sermon, I encourage you to go on to Facebook and listen to it. But to summarize, Jesus, who is fully God and fully man, made himself nothing. He did this not by giving up his deity, but by laying aside his glory. He humbled himself became a servant, and submitted to the Father's will. In obedience to the Father, he was humiliated with the worst kind of death, 
death on a cross. Jesus voluntarily placed himself on the cross to atone for our sins. He willingly died for all people, even those that didn't care about him. Our natural tendency is to be selfish and focus on our own desires. But Jesus, in humility, thought only of others and their needs. We want to grab all of the glory and prestige for ourselves, but Jesus demonstrated another way. Recently, I heard this about humility. When we put ourselves first, we end up bringing other people lower and lower and lower. But when we put others first, it brings both that other person and us higher and higher and higher. Well, I have a friend whose mission in life seems to be, to be placing the needs of others before her own needs. She's constantly encouraging care about people. I genuinely love them. But let's go a little bit deeper. Do you care about that neighbor or coworker who makes your life difficult? Do you care about the kids at school that are mean to you, for those of you that are in school? But that's exactly what God led Immaculate Illibagiza to do. In the book Left to Tell, she tells the story of how her family was brutally murdered in the Rwandan genocide. She survived hidden for 91 days with seven other women in a tiny bathroom at a pastor's home, while hundreds of people carrying machetes were hunting her family and, and others and even her. When she had the opportunity to meet the man responsible for murdering her family, she responded in what most would consider to be a shocking manner. She responded with love and compassion. Why? Because she met Jesus in that tiny bathroom for when she was there for three months. She was given the opportunity to meet the man who murdered the family and actively hunted her. He was in prison. He was emaciated. He was clearly defeated by the evil that he had allowed in his heart. She could have spit on him. She could have berated him. She could have attacked him. But instead, she offered him the greatest form of love and compassion that a person can offer. She offered him forgiveness. To whom do you need to offer forgiveness? To whom do you need to show love and compassion? Our third role model is Epaphroditus, who displays perseverance in suffering. And we see that in chapter 2, verses 25 through 30, which says, Meanwhile, I thought I should send Epaphroditus back to you. He is a true brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier. And he was your messenger to help me in my need. I am sending him because he has been longing to see you. And he was very distressed that you heard he was ill. And he certainly was ill. In fact, he almost died. But God had mercy on him and also on me so that I would not have one sorrow after another. So I am all the more anxious to send him back to you, for I know you will be glad. <clears throat> I'm sorry, so, so I know, for I know you will be glad to see him, and then I will not be so worried about you. Welcome him in the Lord's love and with great joy. And give him the honor that people like him deserve. For he risked his life for the work of the gospel, for the work of Christ. And he was at the point of death while doing for me what you couldn't do from far away. It's clear that Paul had love and appreciation for Epaphroditus because he refers to him as a true brother, a co-worker, a fellow soldier, a messenger, and someone sent to, to take care of his needs. So these are all things that we too can do for each other. Paul was sending Epaphroditus home not as a failure, but as someone who deserved honor and appreciation for their work. Paul knew the Philippians were concerned about Epaphroditus because they'd heard of his serious illness. And Epaphroditus was, was distressed that they knew about this illness and that, he, that they were so concerned for him. But his emotional distress was a sign of maturity because it reveals his love and faithfulness to them. We aren't 100% certain what the nature of his illness uh, was, but we know that it was serious. The text tells us that he risked his life for the work of Christ. It also says that he was at the point of death. Maybe his illness was from exposure to a disease. Maybe it was from uh, exertion in his work. Uh, we don't know, but we know that he was willing to lose his life for the work of the gospel. 
So clearly he lived his life to glorify Christ and share the gospel with others. When I think of personal suffering, because he was a great example, Epaphroditus was a great example of personal suffering, but when I think of personal suffering, I'm always reminded of Tyler Trent. And many of you have heard me refer to him before, but those who aren't, for those who aren't familiar with him, he was a 20-year-old Purdue student who died after his third bout of osteocar sarcoma, which is a rare form of bone cancer. He is described as having extraordinary maturity and positivity as he inspired millions. He dreamed of becoming a national sports writer. And in his short amount of time on earth, he was the subject of ESPN features, named an honorary team captain for Purdue University's football team, received the Sagamore of the Wabash, which is the highest honor for civilians in Indiana, and he won Disney's Wide World of Sports Spirit Award, given annually to college football's most inspirational individual or team. While none of those honors or awards tell you that his life was centered on Jesus, what they did is give him a platform to openly share about his faith. He lived by the motto, God is holy, I am not, Jesus saves, and Christ is my life. Listen to what Tyler wrote in his book, The Upset, Life, Sports, Death, and the Legacy We Leave in the Middle. I had other ideas about the ways I wanted this story to end, but I can say with confidence that I'm really okay with whatever God has planned for me. I trust that his plan is bigger and better than mine. Even if I don't understand the plan, I trust the heart of the planner. He goes on to tell of the scripture the Lord gave him after his original diagnosis, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18, which says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And he said, When I feel lost and I have no idea what to do, I know I can still rejoice, pray, and give thanks no matter the circumstance. He went on to say, it is my prayer that through this story and these words, you will catch a glimpse of the God who has sustained me through the unthinkable and perhaps feel your way toward him and find him because he's not far from any of us. I was once far away from Christ, but he was never far away from me. And Christ is never far away from you either. His love is the ultimate upset that overcomes all the other reasons in life that we have to be upset. Perseverance is vital to growing in your faith because life is hard. God wants his people to persevere no matter what happens. So we, we must learn how to overcome obstacles and difficulties and trials to experience victory in Christ. We have two choices when we're faced with hardship. Trust in God and keep our eyes on him or quit and abandon hope. Our struggles and hardships can become blessings and rewards if we persevere. Maybe you're suffering right now. Maybe you're struggling to have hope and persevere. Well, let me leave you with this final thought from Tyler's book. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 17 says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And he went on to say, What if what is to come is so superior to what we know today that by comparison, even the worst things we can experience now are considered light and momentary compared to then. Can you imagine how incredible this future must be? How does knowing Jesus is with you now and died to save you encourage you and give you hope as you struggle? Well, we've come to our fourth role model, and that is Paul himself, who exemplifies steadfastness in the pursuit of Christ. You might be asking what steadfastness is. Well, it is faithfulness or devotion to a person, a cause, obligations, or duties. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This verse captures the essence of steadfastness by urging believers to stand firm and remain unwavering in their commitment to serving God. 
The reward of steadfastness is strength and courage, enabling us to face challenges with confidence, knowing that God is faithful to his promises. Well, just last week, we studied Paul's steadfastness in chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. I'm not going to read all of those verses. I'm just going to read a few, um, starting in verse 7. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. There is a lot that we can learn from those verses. Uh, we must understand the value of knowing Christ. We can never have enough of Christ, and we should never be complacent about where we are in our Christian life. Paul forgets what is behind so that he's not distracted or led astray by the past, so that he can live for the future. We, like Paul, must be insatiable in our desire to attain more of Christ and make much of his glory. Therefore, our primary goal is to know Christ in every area of our life and as deeply as possible. We shouldn't be consumed with our works or, or our earthly status, but with Christ alone. He is what matters. And when we put him first, everything else falls into place. It'll make us better spouses, better friends, better workers, better bosses, better parents, our temporary gains here on earth become true gains as Christ permeates every area of our lives and transforms us in every way. But he must be first. So in what areas of your life is the Lord calling you to put him first? What might the Lord be asking you to give up so that you can place him first? Paul is inviting us to live as these role models lived, with humility, love, compassion, perseverance in suffering, and steadfastness in pursuing Christ. We can learn a great deal from negative role models, too. I was the youngest in my family, and as a child, I remember thinking, after seeing my siblings get in trouble over something, I remember thinking to myself, don't ever do that. Well, in contrast to those living solely for Christ, Paul now points out those that we should never follow. They are people living for themselves and the temporal. So let's read verses 18 and 19, which say, For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. First, take note that Paul is using some pretty harsh language here. These people are enemies of the, cro of the cross of Christ. So they're a danger to the Christian community. But who exactly is Paul referring to? Honestly, theologians aren't 100% sure. They could be the Judaizers that we learned about last week um, in chapter 3, verse 2. But the language Paul uses implies that they were a part of the Christian community because he weeps over them. Maybe they were people who had fallen away. Paul says he's also warned the Philippians before about them, so maybe they're a threat from outside the church. It's likely that they are false teachers who had begin to, begun to influence the church in Philippi. Paul doesn't discuss anything that they may have taught, though. Instead, he focuses on their behavior. These are people who might have right biblical teaching, but they don't have right living, and that is an abomination to God. They are Christians who prefer a worldly lifestyle and not a godly lifestyle. Those who claim to know Christ but fail to live accordingly are enemies of the cross. So let's look at the four descriptions that Paul uses for them. Their destiny is destruction. 
Paul isn't referring to physical death here, but their anti-Christ behavior, which made them enemies of the cross and would doom them to final judgment and eternal punishment. Their God is their stomach, most likely refers to a sensual lifestyle devoted to fleshly desires and the things of this world. Pleasure had become their God. Their glory is in their shame, is the next descriptor. Glory is another term for boasting. Paul had previously spoken about boasting in Christ, and now he's referring to the opposite, boasting in self-indulgent behavior. They pretended to be right with God, but their actions are shameful. Their mind is set on earthly things, points out that every aspect of their life is summed up in their self-centered earthly behavior. Each one of us must choose between having an earthly mindset or a heavenly mindset. Our thoughts determine our actions, and our actions will end up determining our eternal destiny. So we each have a choice between temporary pleasure or eternal joy, earthly pursuits or the heavenly prize. If we keep our eyes focused on Jesus, the things of this world will fail to enslave us and we'll be free to live wholly for God. Sadly, we have seen too many famous preachers who have preached accurate biblical truth, but they have failed to live right in the eyes of the Lord. I believe that they break the heart of Jesus. In Matthew 23, verse 27, Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones, full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. These are people that we must learn from, but not follow in their steps. What pleasure has pulled you away from following Jesus with your whole heart. Let's look at our final verses for today, verses 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Heaven is not merely a future that we will enjoy someday. It is a present reality. From the moment we entered a saving relationship with Jesus, we received our citizenship there. And there are, there are advantages of citizenship. A citizen is a person who legally belongs to a country and has the rights and protection of that country. Citizens adopt the culture and practices of the nation or kingdom to which they belong. So as citizens of heaven, we enjoy the rights and freedom Jesus grants us. And we grow in the fruits of this kingdom. Things like love, joy, peace, self-control, hope, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. We grow closer to Jesus. When we grow closer to Jesus, those are the things that develop. However, we tend to forget about those advantages because all of us were born into the kingdom of this world, which Satan rules. Consequently, we grow up adopting the culture, practices, and values that he instigates. Satan's kingdom enslaves its citizens. With darkened hearts and minds, we blindly follow him into the very sins that pull us deeper into slavery. We remain captives in this kingdom of sin, headed for eternal destruction until Jesus frees us. Even after Jesus frees us, those earthly pleasures or sins sometimes distract us from following him with our whole heart. This is why we read in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. But we also read in Ephesians 2, verses 6 and 7, that God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Currently we await our prize, our Savior Jesus is coming back for us because he promised he would. He delivers us from the wrath of this world and will bring evil to, um, in this world to its end. 
Those who place their faith in Jesus as, as their Savior have been redeemed from the slavery of sin and are given over to God for an absolutely secure future. Christ, who is the sovereign over all, will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. The verb transform here indicates a total change of our physical bodies. But this will be like no transformation that has happened in the history of creation. The term lowly bodies literally reads bodies of our humiliation in the Greek text, which uses the same term that describes Jesus Jesus humbling himself in chapter 2, verse 8, where Christ humbled himself and became obedient to death on a cross. Our bodies, which are ravaged by sin and decaying, will never again decay, for they will be like Jesus' glorious body. We must aggressively strive in the present to know more and more of Christ. We haven't reached our goal yet, so we mustn't be satisfied with where we are today, but desire even more of Jesus. We've been promised transformed bodies. We've been promised eternity with Jesus. So why would we forfeit this gold for earthly garbage that will never satisfy? As hard as it is sometimes, self-control as we live for Jesus in this life will lead us to a satisfying life. The destiny awaiting us is worth far more than the sacrifice of worldly pleasures. So let me ask you, is there anything that you wouldn't give up for Jesus? Only fools play games when their eternal destiny is at stake. Are you ready to grow up? If so, take this mature mindset that Paul described and live it out Will you seek more of Christ in every area of your life? Will you choose to follow people who seek to know Jesus more deeply? Will you allow your love for Jesus to permeate your thinking so that it determines your behavior? How can, your mo how can you model behavior that honors Jesus to a watching world that may not know him? What earthly desires will you lay aside for that which will never fade away? How can Jesus help you persevere in your current struggles? Well, we have seen that a mature Christian is indeed led and transformed by Jesus. But maybe you've never surrendered your heart to Jesus. Well, I want to tell you that it is as easy as ABC. So if you are sitting here today and you have never given your heart to Jesus, I encourage you to do that today. A, you just admit that you've sinned. B, you believe that Christ died as a sacrifice for your sins. And C, you commit to live for Jesus. I encourage you today, whether you're investigating who Jesus is or, or you've been walking with him for a while, don't leave here today without surrendering all of your heart to him. I promise you won't regret it.